All right, so we already talked about encoding. Now we're going to launch into how our mind stores our memories. And so storage is really how we keep our memories. How, how do we keep it all there and keep it from flying away? We know that some memories are very fleeting. They only last very quickly. You might wake up and remember your dreams, but even five minutes later, you can no longer remember your dreams. Those memories are very fleeting. Whereas some memories are very lasting. And what makes that different? For instance, if we were to try to remember the numbers I have here on the screen, 732-847-1983, would you be able to do it? What would you have to do to keep that chain of numbers in your mind? First, we're going to talk about different types of memories because our brain is capable of storing many different subtypes of memories. For instance, we have to consider the length of our memories. And so when we think about the length of our memories, we have at least three levels. And so the very quickest type of memory that is the most fleeting is considered our sensory memory. This is really just how long it takes for our sensory nervous system to get information to our central nervous system. And this is very quick, but it's not instant. And so a good way to understand what is in your sensory memory is if you've ever played with a sparkler or a flashlight or anything that's very bright on a dark night and you wave it around, you can wave the sparkler around in a circle. And although the sparkler never forms a circle, it is constantly moving, your eyes and your brain may perceive it as a circle or a figure eight. And it's the idea that the sensory memory is just a very few fractions of a second long but it's not instant. And so it looks like the sparkler is in multiple places at once. And we can see the light in multiple places at once. And so this is the idea that the sensory memory is only as quick as it takes for that sensory information to get to our brain. And that is not usually what we think about when we think about memory, but it is a technically a subtype of memory. A lot of times when we think about memory, we're thinking about our short term, also called our working memory. And this is the memory we have to constantly work at. If we stop trying to hold something in our memory, we lose it. And so this may be that somebody gives you a phone number or an address, or you were uh, trying to recall something in a recipe and you have to keep checking back. And while you're not checking back, you're constantly, constantly trying to remind yourself of what's there. And then we have our long-term memory. And long-term memory is not something you constantly have to work at. It's something that you can put out of your consciousness for a period of time and you can access it later on. So our sensory memory tends to be fractions of a second long. Our short-term, also known as working memory, may be something that is a few minutes to a few hours long, as long as we keep working at it. And our long-term memory is gonna be days, weeks, years long, uh, but not everything in our long-term memory will stay the same length. And so our long-term memory does have a lot of diversity in it. So it's important to understand that some memories flee very quickly and some memories sustain and persist over time. Now, in terms of our memories, we find that there's some memories that are very personal to us, that they could be episodic. So episodic is the type of memory that you can play in your mind like a movie. It has a plot. There's events that happen before other events. Maybe some of the stuff gets jumbled, but you sort of understand how it plays out. It's stuff that makes you, you. It's the idea that you know who you are, you know who your family members are, uh, you understand what your relationships are. You can think back to earlier grades, you can think back to your own personal history. So episodic memory is really your own personal memory. Versus semantic memory is less personal information. It's more factual and sterile, isolated information, trivia. It's the idea that you don't really remember the time that you went to a park and saw ducks, but you know that ducks spend time at parks. You may not remember you learning to drive a car, but you understand how to drive a car. You may understand the capitals of different countries or just random trivia knowledge that you could understand or book knowledge, but you, it's not the stuff about you learning that book knowledge. Now for most of us, our episodic and our semantic memory are really entwined and work alongside each other for most of the time. We only really tend to see this separated if somebody experiences a brain injury event, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Another differentiation between our memory is again, our explicit versus implicit. We see these words come up again and again in psychology, they are important. So not only can encoding be explicit and implicit, but also when we go to retrieve our memories, we can find that some memories are explicit. We can know that we know them, we can talk about them. And so explicit memory is also called declarative memory. 
can you say, this is the card I had, or this is what I know? Or if you, somebody says, you know, what's your address? Can you say your address? If somebody could say, what is the capital of this country? Can you say it? Versus implicit memory is not stuff we're able to talk about. We, our brain doesn't really even know that we know this information, but our muscles do. This can be the idea that you have forgotten a password to a computer program, and as much as you think about it in your brain, you can't remember your password. But when you sit down and put your, fi your fingers on the keys, all of a sudden your hands and your muscle memory remembers your password. Or uh, how to dial a phone number. If back in the day we used to dial phone numbers, you might have forgot someone's phone number, but when you have the phone in your hand, your thumb remembers, and all of a sudden you dial the phone number. And so it's in that muscle memory. So it's the idea that you might say, well, cognitively, I don't remember the steps to ballet. I haven't done dance in decades. But then when you try, your body remembers. So implicit is the stuff we can't really talk about, we can't articulate with language, but our body does remember in an implicit way. And we find that for a lot of us, we may not remember learning things, we might not even know that we know things, but we can recall that implicit information if we're tested. And a final differentiation I want to talk about is retrospective versus prospective memory. Retrospective refers to old stuff. It's the old versus new, what we've done. And so retrospective refers to our previous experiences. This is the idea, can you remember your childhood bedroom, your childhood pet, and your childhood best friend? Versus prospective is, can you recall what your bedroom looks like right now, your current bedroom? Do you know the name of your current pet? And do you know your current best friend? This is the idea that retrospective is really our ability to remember things as they were, and prospective memory is to remember things as they are now. Keep this in mind because we will be coming back to retrospective and prospective memory in a little bit later on. But retrospective is a type of memory about the past and prospective memory is a type of memory about the present or what is currently happening. Now for all these different types of memory, short-term, long-term, sensory memory, explicit, implicit, episodic, semantic, retrospective, and prospective, what happens in a lot of this is we have to rehearse. And so rehearsal is especially important when something is in our short-term or working memory. This is the idea that this is the memory that could stay there for a few moments or a few hours, but we constantly have to retrieve it and constantly have to recall it and work on it. So this is the idea if somebody gave you a phone number and it's a lot of digits and you're trying to re remember it or an address you have to go to, or you're trying to remember to put something in your calendar. Uh, this is really difficult when you teach in person and at the end of a lecture a lot of students come up with special requests and you don't write them down and you're trying to remember them in your head by the time you get back to your office. It can be really overwhelming, a lot, a very high and heavy cognitive load at those points in time. And so rehearsal does better when we have reduced cognitive load. We don't have to worry about a lot. Uh, it doesn't do so well when we have a lot on our plate and a lot that we're trying to hold and rehearse at once. And so this is very much tied to your working memory. There is personal differences in how well we can rehearse and there is personal differences in what we can hold in our working memory. For instance, were you able to recall the number that I showed a few slides ago? Uh, maybe you weren't, maybe you were. Uh, if you look here, this is the answer. So if you were having a hard time recalling it, you can, you can double check it.